Good evening. I'm so, I'm so happy. I'm so honored. Um, I hope I can, I can say what I want to say. Um, first of all, uh, I want to share this award with David. He's working with me since the beginning. And um, this morning, I remember a story that maybe can, can, be, can act as a metaphor of the, the, the things we've been doing, been doing together. One day, he visit uh, Mozambique uh, in a period that we have that civil war. And um, when I received David in my house, he was so worried and, and he asked me how, how was the situation. And, and I was trying to calm him, said, oh, no worries, everything is calm. <clears throat> and uh, immediately after, I said that there was an explosion, huge explosion. And a bomb that was, you know, exploded next to my door. And um, after the explosion, there was that big, terrible silence. And um, we were more than surprised. We empty. There's no language to translate that feeling. And I thought that we are united in this divided task. He was translating words, I was translating that silence that, that sometimes we are, we are suffering. So I prepared something to say to you. I hope it's not too much. Okay. Uh, it's a great honor to be uh, here and to receive this award. I'm saying this is not just a formality. This is really a deep feeling. Because the, import the importance of this award goes very far away far beyond, sorry, the work of a particular writer. What we are celebrating here in Oklahoma, year after year, it's more than, than literature. With the, the Neustadt Award, we are all praising the cultural diversity of the world and the cultural diversity of each one of us. Of us. That is crucial in a moment where personal and national identities are constructed like fortresses, as protection against the threats of those we are presented to us as aliens. This prize is important for the relations between the United States and Mozambique. Our two nations seem to be situated not only in different continents, but in different planets. Despite all diplomatic and political efforts, a considerable ignorance still prevails between Mozambique and the United States. We tend to assume that that uh, remoteness is something natural, given the physical location of our countries. However, we must nowadays question what is presented as normal and as natural. There are indeed other reasons to lead to our mutual lack of knowledge, and those reasons have nothing to do with geography. We have a common struggle for freedom, democracy, and independence. We share a past and a present of resistance against injustice and discrimination. But in the quest to affirm the uniqueness of our nations, we have created, even without knowing, a reductive and simplistic vision of the others and of ourselves. We suffer from a narrow and stereotyped vision of a multicolor reality, we are only able to recognize one cultural dimension, dimension of the world. The New Star Prize has the merit of promoting dialogue between cultures and to create bridges where there is distance and worse than that, mere indifference. It's good to know that literature can help building neighborhoods in a world that imagine that the proximity between cultures is totally resolved by technological solutions. Dear friends, I'm the second son, this has been said already, I'm the second son of a Portuguese couple forced to immigrate, trying to escape from the fascist, fascist regime in Portugal. Each night, my mother and my father told me stories. They thought they were getting us to sleep. In fact, they were pr producing a second and eternal birth. 
What fascinated me was not exactly the content of those tales. As a matter of fact, I can't remember a single one of those stories. What I remember, first of all, is having my parents just for me, next to my bed, next to my dreams. More than anything, I remember the passion that they found in the invention of those stories. That intense, intensive, sorry, that intense pleasure at the reason, using words, they could travel and visit their missing homeland. They could erase time and distance. In that very familiar and domestic moment, the very essence of what is literature is present, was present, a chance to migrate from ourselves, a chance to become others inside ourselves, a chance to re-enchant the world. Literature is not only a way to affirm our existence, it's a permission to disappear and to allow the presence of those who seem to be absent. I come from a nation which is regarded as one of the poorest in the world. I don't know how poverty is measured, but many of the African languages spoken in my country do not, do not have specific words to say poor. To designate a poor person, one uses the term shisiwana. This word means orphan. A poor person is someone who lives without family and without friends. He's someone who has lost the ties of solidarity. This other poverty, born of solitude, is more widespread than we might think. Never before, our world has been so small, so simultaneous, so instantaneous. But this speed has not solved our solitude. Never before have there been so many roads and never before have we made so few visits. What could, I, what could bind us together would be the desire to tell and to listen to stories. There are ma many hidden dimensions of the, the heart of telling stories. A few years ago, I experienced an episode that showed me a different meaning of what I do as a writer. It happened in 2008 in northern Mozambique, in a coastal village called Palma. It's a remote, a very, very remote region without water, without roads, without electricity, in the middle of the savannah. I had finished my day's work as a biologist and I, I was in the shadow of my tent when a peasant came and called me. Come here, he said, come here and see a man who's been, who has been killed. I went into the darkness and I followed the old man along the path in the middle of the bush. How did he die? I asked. And the man replied, he was killed by a lion. And that lion is still nearby and is going to come back to fetch the rest of the body. I returned hastily to my tent with no wish to see whatever he, he, he had to show to me. I closed the zip of my tent knowing how inadequate this gesture was as a protection. A short distance from me lie a corpse ripped up by a lion and there was a wild beast roaming nearby like a murderous shadow. During my professional life, I have worked for many years in regions where there are still dangerous animal, animals. But I didn't know how to deal with a situation like that. I remember that the first thing I did was to switch on my small flashlight and begin to write in my notebook. It was, I was not describing what, I, what was going on because I didn't know, nor did I want to know what was happening. The truth is that until daybreak, I was busy writing in order to not to be overcome by, with fear. This fear was a primitive feeling, a memory of another time in which our fragility was more evident. I am an urban person. I, am, I was born in and, and raised in modernity. I had no defense against a fear that was more ancient than humanity itself. 
I gradually realized that the wild creatures were not lions, but the monsters that we have dwelt in, within, within us for centuries. And only later I understood. It wasn't really the tent that, that I was taking shelter. It was, I was taking shelter in fiction. I was creating a story like someone making a house, not just to live, but to erase reality. Without knowing, I was beginning to write a novel called The Confession of the Lioness. But it was another of my novels which, has, which was the basis for the choice of this prize, the novel called Terra Sonambula, Sleepwalking Land. This book speaks about a dramatic moment in the history of Mozambique for 16 years. We suffered a civil war which killed the, co the economy and, creep and crippled the country. I will ask David to read a little, the, the first part, the first page of that, of that book. First chapter, The Dead Road. War had killed the road thereabouts. Hyenas slunk along the tracks, snuffling among ashes and dust. The landscape had blended sadnesses, the likes of which had never been seen before, in colors that clung to the inside of the mouth. They were dirty colors, so dirty that they had lost all their freshness no longer daring to rise into the blue on the wing. Here the sky had become unimaginable and, create, and creatures had got used to the ground in resigned apprenticeship of death. The road that now unfolds before our eyes crosses no other. It lies more prostrate than the centuries, alone bearing the burden of all distances. Along the verge, burnt out cars rot away the residue of pillage. In the surrounding savannah, only the baobabs contemplate the world shedding its flowers. An old man and a boy make their way along the road. They walk with swaying gait, as if journeying has been their only occupation since birth. Their destination is the other side of nowhere, their arrival a non-departure, awaiting what lies ahead. They are fleeing the war, the war that has contaminated their whole country. They advance under the illusion that somewhere beyond there lies a quiet haven. They walk barefoot, their clothes the same color as the road. The old man's name is Tuahir. He is skinny and seems to have lost all his substance. The boy is called Muidinga. He has been walking ahead ever since he left the refugee camp. He has a slight but noticeable limp, his leg dallying longer than his step, the vestige of an illness that had but recently dragged him near to death. It was old to a year who had taken him in when everyone else had abandoned him. The boy no longer had a country. His snot oozed from his whole head rather than from his nose. The old man had to teach him all the beginnings to walk, speak, think. Muidinga became a little boy all over again. But this second childhood was hurried along by the needs of survival. When they had begun their journey, he was already in the habit of singing, giving vent to his gamely self-amusement. In solitude's company, however, his song eventually migrated from itself. The two travelers matched the road, withered and devoid of hope. Now Muidinga and Tuahia pause before a burnt out bus. They talk and disagree. The boy throws his sack to the ground, arousing the dust. The old man chides him, I'm telling you boy, we'll set up house right here. But here, in a bus that's all burnt up, you know nothing, child. What's already been burnt can't burn again. Thank you. Thank you.
Those 16 years of conflict left a million dead out of a population of 18 million. In its intention, violence is opposed to the art of telling stories. That intention is to dehumanize us. That dehumanization is achieved in various ways. We were living in a kind of absolute solitude, isolated from hope, incapable of turning the present into a treasure of trove of stories. We were all alone, the dead and the living, without a past, without a future, without stories. The present was only worthwhile insofar as it was born to be forgotten. Terror Sonambula was the only book I found it painful to write. I'm not a masochist again. Because it was written during the war at a time when I was also besieged by despair. For months I spent sleepless nights visited by friends and colleagues who had been killed during the conflict. It was as if they came knocking on the door of my insomnia, asking to leave stories, even if they were lies or just a way for me to fall asleep. I remember that once after one of these sleepless nights, I came out of the building of the biological station where I was working and I sat on the beach. And I realized that there, very close to the breaking waves, there was a whale which had decided to come and die on the beach. Then I saw people arriving hastily at the beach. In an instant, they rushed together at the dying animal to act chance from heat, ripped the piece to pieces with the greed of a hunger of centuries. It yet not died and its bones were already shining in the sun. Little by little, I came to think of my country as one of those whales coming to die in agony on the beach. Death had not yet come and yet the knives were already still in pieces of it, each person trying to take as much as possible for himself. As if that it was the last animal, the final opportunity to grab a meal. I went back to my room, weighed down by a sadness without cure. On that early morning, I wrote the final chapter of my novel. Two months later, when I was delivering the text to the publisher, the news arrived of a peace agreement. And when the peace agreement was signed in 1992, we thought that revenge and the settling of scores would be predictable. But it didn't happen like that. People decide on a kind of collective amnesia. The reminders of violence were cast into a pit of oblivion. We know that this oblivion was false. A war is impossible to forget. But we wanted the war to forget us. Mozambique's experience show how literature can play an active role in the construction of peace. Fiction and poetry do not cause the guns to fall silent, but they can reconcile us with the past, no matter how painful this can be. Fiction and poetry can help re reconquer our inner tranquility and promote reconciliation with others. By means of stories, these others were freed from the condition of demons. I can say with pride that poets and writers have helped to rehumanize my country. Unfortunately, it's not so much the stories which unite, which unite humanity. What unites us today in all countries, in all continents, is above, above all fear. The same feeling of abandonment, I never, never can say this word, that's of insecurity, bring us together everywhere. There are no great or small powers that are safe from fear. We live the same anguish faced with the other, transformed into an enemy. We will we'll, we'll live in a small tent, surrounded by the threat, real or imaginary, of a beast in the dark wanting to devour us. The fear that rules us is in large measure, nourished by the, prof the profound ignorance that we have 
of each of one another. Literature can be a response against that, against the invitation to fabricate fear and mistrust. Literature and storytelling confirms us as relatives and neighbors in our infinite diversity. I'll, I'll, I'll ask David again to read a little bit of that book. This is at the end of the book, The Witch Doctor's Prediction. Do you weep for the present? Well know that the days to come will be worse still. That's why they made this war, to poison the womb of time, so that the present would give birth to monsters instead of hope. Don't seek your relatives anymore, those who have left for other lands in search of peace. Even if you find them again, they will not recognize you. You have turned into beasts of the wild, without family, without a nation. For this war was not made to take you away from your country, but to take the country away from within you. Now weapons are your only soul. They have stolen so much from you that not even your dreams are your own. Nothing of your land belongs to you, and even the sky and the seas will be the property of outsiders. It will be a thousand times worse than the past, for you will not see the faces of the new owners of these bosses, and these bosses will use your brothers to punish you. And a wind will sweep the stars through the skies, and the night will be too small for so many lights exploding over your heads. The sands will be swept up in furious whirlwinds and birds will fall to earth exhausted and disasters will occur that have no name. Plantations will be turned into graveyards and from the dried up wizened plants only stones of salt will grow. The women will chew sand and there will be so many of them and so famished will they be that a vast hole will tear the guts out of the earth and leave it hollow. But in the end, there will, still, there will still be a morning like this one, full of new light, and a distant voice will be heard, like a memory of before we became people. And the tones of a song will well up, ge the gentle lull of the first mother. This song, yes indeed, will be ours, the memory of a deep root that they were unable to wrench out of us. All this will happen if we are able to rid ourselves of this time that has made animals out of us. Let us strive to die like the people we no longer are. Let the animal die that this war has turned us into. It is very gratifying to know that um, the winner of the NSK Prize is an African author as well. This means that Africans are imposing themselves on the international scene without recourse to any paternalistic criteria. In truth, for some years now, we Africans writers are feeling ourselves from a literature, are freeing ourselves from a literature dominated by a desire to affirm our identity. Formerly, we felt as an historic and psychological need to demonstrate that we are as able as others. This period of affirmation made sense after centuries of cultural denial and because of the history of the African continent. But today, a new generation of Africans is more and more free to act as universal writers. They feel free to write about any subject in any language they choose. Dear friends, the Neustadt, the New Start Prize is announced as follows, and I quote, this is the first international literary award of this scope to originate in the United States. And it's one of the very few international prizes for, for which poets, novelists, and playwriters are equally 
eligible. I would like to thank the Neust the Neustadt family. Thank you very much, Dolores, Katie, Nancy. Um, the University of Oklahoma and the world's literature today for the open and all-embracing conception of this initiative. The format of this celebration reveals a concern not to reduce the event to an award ceremony alone. In this way, justice is done to the principle that what is important are books and not so much their authors. I present myself to you not as a representative of a place, of an ideology of, or, or a religion, but I will never forget those who give meaning to my writing, the anonymous people of my country. Some of these Mozambicans who are, together with me, author of my books, do not know how to write. Many don't even speak Portuguese, but they are guardians in their everyday lives of a magical, poetical dimension to the world that illuminates my writing and gives delight to my existence. It would be an injustice not to mention here the people who have given my presence their support. First of this person is, the first of these people is Gabriela Germandi, the member of the panel that proposed me as a candidate. Without her, I would not be here. I would not be here if weren't for my longtime translator, David Brookshaw. A translator is a co-author and should be featured and should feature on the covers of the books. And his presence in the ceremony is totally justified. Accompanying me is my wife, Patricia, who is my primary inspiration and my first reader. Present with us is my daughter, Luciana, and she represents it here my other children, Madio and Rita. No price can prove stronger than the delight we have in seeing ourselves born in our own children. To them I owe this feeling of a lived eternity. I shall end by reading a poem. That's not me, that will, that's David who will read. I, I wrote some years ago, and I remember this verse when I discovered that the emblem of this prize was an eagle's feather. This symbolic representation is a metaphor of a writing that seeks to have the lightness of wings. I ask David to, to read. This is a very rough version, I'm afraid, of a poem, um, which uh, I assume that he was, uh, he was going to read it in Portuguese. In some other life, I was a bird. I preserve the memory of landscapes spread out and escarpments skimmed in flight. I live with the heartbeat of a bird's wing and I plunge like a lightning flash fam fam famished for earth. I preserve the plume that remains in my breast just as a man preserves his name over the span of time. In some other life I was a bird, in some other bird I was life. Thank you very much for everything.